But yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about Arsenal versus Spurs, man. North London derby today. Obviously, when these two teams meet, for me, it's one of the best derbies in, in English football, right? You look at United versus Liverpool, that's becoming so one-sided recently. City United hasn't been like a competitive rivalry since, bro, what, the early 2010s? It's been so long uh, since both those teams were on like a, a level footing. For me, Arsenal versus Spurs, that's the, 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 the game that when I talk, think of derbies, it usually provides goals, excitement, like energy, hatred between both teams and both sets of fans. But I have to be honest with you guys, right? I've left that game so underwhelmed. Not by Arsenal, not by Arsenal. We'll talk about Arsenal, right? But by Spurs, genuinely, yeah. Um, um, if I was an Ars uh, a Spurs fan, I would be disgusted. I'm not even a Spurs fan. I watch this game as a complete neutral. And genuinely, I feel so annoyed watching that game. Let, let's, let's add some context, right? Let's, let's talk about the buildup to this game. Arsenal are missing... You could argue when everyone is fit, they're starting midfield, right? Declan Rice is a starter, no doubt about it. Martin Odegaard is the captain. He's a starter, no doubt about it. And even Mikel Marino, you would assume that once he's kind of fit and, and, and integrated into the team, that's going to be the midfield three, right? All three of those guys are out. They're not available for Arsenal. The way Arteta set up his team to play today, well, everyone gives Arteta a stick, right? And during this whole Barclays men week, Everybody was kind of hitting Arteta with like, oh, he's part of the problem of why we don't have Barclay. Let's be real, right? For as much a, a, as people hit Arteta with like the Pep clone thing, Arteta's extremely pragmatic at times, bro. He's extremely pragmatic. Let's look at his game plan today, right? He's missing his entire midfield three. How does he set up? He sets up four, four, two. Two banks of four, two up front. Jorginho and Partey in midfield. Saka and Martinelli out wide. Trossard and Havertz up front. Stay compact. Defend your box well, win your individual duels, take your opportunities when they come, attack the opposition box, and try and get away with a result. I'm sorry, if you closed your eyes and watched that performance without seeing the manager, you would have been forgiven for thinking it was David moyes But he got the job done. He got the job done, man. Because football doesn't reward the, the artists. Football doesn't reward the poets. Get the job done. That's what Arteta did. He was held, dealt a bad hand, bad injuries, big suspension to Rice. How do we get out of a result? He did it. You look at, at Spurs, right? And let me preface this by saying this. I'm a big Ange Postecoglou fan. I think he's done a tremendous job at the club. I think what he did last season when a lot of people thought Spurs would be closer to 9th and 10th after losing Harry Kane, having them in a top four battle nearly the entire year, the football in particular that they were playing. I like his, his rugged... Uh, style, like the way he, he kind of speaks in interviews, uh, how honest he is. I, I'm a fan of him, bro. I actually really like Ange Postecoglou. I've been on the record saying that if you, Ten Hag were ever to leave United, I would I would actually like to see uh, Ange Postecoglou as a candidate to replace him. So be, let me preface that by saying this. I'm an Ange Postecoglou fan. However, he goes into this game uh, and they're asking him, how are your your, your, your players kind of dealing with, with this big game coming up ahead? And he, he makes this point, right? And again, I love Ange, but I feel at times, too, he says these answers that you can clearly tell, like, he's playing into a character at times, it almost feels like. I'm not trying to say he's fake, like, he is who he is, but sometimes you can tell it's exaggerated. And this one, for me, is an exaggerated response. He's talking, like, what, what did he say? He says, well, mate, honestly, I, I'd actually be, I, I'd be worried if my players treat this game any different to any other game. Because, I, basically, he's trying to, to drill home the thought that I want my players to be ready and fired up for every single game the same way. There shouldn't be a game where there's more on the line than the other. And I actually like that mentality. I think people were hitting at him saying, oh, he should know what this North London Derby means. I, let's understand what he's trying to say. I don't think he's wrong in saying that. But Ange, mate, sorry, sorry to tell you here, I think there's a big issue here. Because I think your team actually does prepare for this game differently than any other one. I think they actually do go into this game with a different mindset than any other one. The problem for you is it's a bad mindset. They go and play Arsenal every single time now, every single season, twice a year, guaranteed to come in soft and almost afraid to play Arsenal. I watched Spurs the la this year and last year as well too. The second game when Arsenal are basically on the precipice of the title. They need to basically win out and they're on crazy form and they have to go to White Hart Lane or Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, whatever it's called these days. And Spurs have the opportunity to kind of Put that dead in the water. You look at the way Arsenal came in and within like 30 minutes, we're already 3-0 up and Spurs barely lifted a hand on them. It was easy. And it seems like every single game now that Spurs play Arsenal, it's exactly that. It's easy. We talk about how it's such a, a passionate derby. It's only, a, it's only passionate between the fans. Let's be real. Because you look on the pitch, every single time these two teams play against each other, Spurs are almost afraid to lay a glove on them, man. 
genuinely like I'm, I'm watching today right like and th- that's not to say like spurs don't have any like men in their team right I, th- I find it so ironic that this is fuad's favorite team because for as much as he kind of hammers home this dog and this real men shit spurs don't have a lot of them and you can tell me oh guys like romero guys like bentancourt look man it's it's all I, I like both of those players i think they're both good but it's all well and good being like a a tough guy and being kind of a bastard when you're going and playing Brighton or when you're playing Everton or when you're playing uh, Leicester against Jamie Vardy. It's easy to be a tough guy against those teams. Don't get it twisted. Everybody beats up on them. What's in you? What are you made of when you go and play your city rivals? Biggest game of of your fans' season. These, every single year at the start of the season, Spurs fans look at their calendar and circle this date. It means more to them. Let's be real. But the way their team actually executes on the pitch, this is why I said the Fuad last year. Spurs fans write checks that their own players can't cash in. Honestly, today I thought was so, so, so pathetic. And I'm not even a Spurs fan. I have nothing at stake in this game as a fan. If anything, I'd probably want Arsenal to win because I don't want City to win the league. And Spurs are potential candidates for top four over United. But genuinely, I, I felt so like just underwhelmed watching Spurs today. Like this was a, a, a game going into it looking at the issues that Arsenal had, where Spurs should be looking at this and saying, yeah, we can kind of make a statement victory today, or at least a statement performance. And forget about winning. At least kind of control the game, be the the protagonist, create chances, put Arsenal on the back foot. Genuinely, how many clear-cut chances did Spurs really create today? How many? I can think, uh, clear-cut. The the only chance that really jumps to mind is that Solanke header that he really climbs over his center back to even get any sort of contact on. Outside of that, genuinely, right? I don't feel like Arsenal were ever really threatened today. And that's concerning. They're missing almost their entire midfield. And Spurs didn't lay a glove on them. Like, what what better opportunity are you going to have to make your mark in a North London derby if it's not today? I don't know, man. I give massive credit to Arsenal. Because like I said, they've obviously been dealt a, a really tough hand. I didn't think they were particularly amazing today. But again, they didn't really have to be. They took their chances, dominated both boxes, win your fucking duels as Arteta goes on and and, and says all the time and got the win another day at the office and it's needed because you look at the the fixtures coming up next Atalanta in the Europa League Manchester City away from home in the league that result against Brighton was a big one but it's all about how you reply right and today is the perfect way to reply but man Spurs (sighs) genuinely so so disappointing look I'm not even like let's 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 also make this clear, right? It's not all on just the mentality of the players and the players don't do enough and all that stuff. It's also on Ange. First of all, it's baffling to me how the same mistakes that we saw basically epitomized Spurs last season. We all know what Spurs' issues last year were. They get hit easily on the break and they are awful, awful. Genuinely one of the worst teams I've ever seen at defending set pieces. Vicario, man. Oh my God. Look, I'm a Man United fan, right? I watched David De Gea at my club for 13 years. And David De Gea at his best, don't get it twisted, one of the best shot-stopping goalkeepers in the world. But one thing De Gea was never good at, from the first game he played in the league, oh, from the first game in the Community Shield in 11-12 against City, where Les Scott jumped over him, basically. And then in his first league game against West Brom, where he failed to claim a cross, and I think it was Shane Long who scored, De Gea, for his entire time, at Man United was the worst shot, like the worst ball claiming or high cross claiming goalkeeper I ever saw. Incredible shot stopper. Claiming crosses, dominating his penalty box, one of the worst I saw. But I'm sorry, man. Vicario, Vicario makes David De Gea look like Oliver Kahn in terms of the way he, he, he goes and dominates his box. He makes De Gea look like Neuer. I don't understand it. The guy won't leave his box. Uh, well, he won't leave his line. Vicario is glued to his line. He never comes out. And when he does, he gets bullied. You're the goalkeeper. You have an advantage over everybody. You can jump up, stretch your hands out, and catch the ball. And yet you still get bullied aerially against guys who can't use their hand. That, that's, that's baffling to me, man. That's baffling to me. But this is stuff that as a manager, you knew existed last year. You know your team plays too high and, and way too open. But fair enough. That's your style of play. You, what is it? It's basically high risk, high reward. But the defending set pieces, that's something that in preseason either should have been addressed in the transfer window or addressed repeatedly on the training ground. Literally beat those mistakes out of your team. It's more of the same. It's more of the same, man. You look last week against Newcastle. How do they get beat twice? Uh, on the break. Team is wide open. This week, how do you get beat? Set pieces. It's the same story. And then you look at the lineup that Ange puts out, right? Bro, from the from the first minute I looked at that, 
that, that lineup. Madison and Bentancur in midfield. In midfield too. Kulusevski, Brennan Johnson, who, oh my God, man. When we talk about big money signings that, that have not perf have not lived up to the price tag, maybe he's lucky because he plays for Spurs, right? But this guy is not, he's not, he's not worth half of what, of what Spurs paid for him. He can be a, a, a good Premier League player. We've seen that for for Nottingham Forest, we saw it at times for Spurs too. He's not a, he's not a scrub, but come on, man, he is not worth half of what what Spurs paid for him. J Jesus Christ, man! And then you you look at it as well too, Hyungmin Son, and then Dominic Solanke. You're effectively playing with four attackers, five even, I would say. Solanke, Son, Brennan Johnson. Um, who's the other one? Kulusevski and James Madison. James Madison. I feel Ange has completely killed any of the creativity and any of the goal scoring threat he once had in his game completely off by how deep he plays James Madison. James Madison now is almost being tasked with playing um, as a deep lying playmaker. I, I can't understand it. I can't understand it. This is your most creative player. He's a huge threat off set pieces, has a shot on him, creates chances well off set pieces and an open play. And you've effectively nullified his game because you've moved him 15, 20 yards deeper, playing him in a double pivot basically with Bentancourt. I can't understand it. But anyways, you go into the super attacking lineup. And again, it leaves you even more defensively exposed than you normally are, which is already saying something to begin with, but it opens you up even more. And then it's not even like you're getting like the reward from the risk because your team doesn't create shit, man. How many times did we see Poro basically bust the gut to get down the line? Odober towards the end. Kolozevsky, Brennan Johnson, Hyungmin Sun, get to the line. Cross it. Who's there to, to get it? David Raya. Easy. Or all the way over the top to absolutely nobody. It must be. I mean, look, I understand Arsenal are an incredible defensive unit. Incredible. For me, you could argue the best defensive team in the world. Genuinely. The way, they, the way they're structured, their individual defenders, they're a brilliant defensive team. But damn, man, you can't even threaten them a little. I looked at Solanke today, right? I mean, look, he's got to do better. Sure. It's, it's also his first game back. Uh, from injury and he's barely played with this 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 group but bro as a center forward today normally you, one thing you can say about spurs i feel is they actually create chances today bro, you're feeding off scraps today man honestly wow like for this to be one of the most highly anticipated games of the season if i'm a spurs fan I'm, i'd be sick to my stomach you wait all week you you argue with arsenal fans online fuad is out here saying this player is better than this one i'd rather have this one than this one that's what fans are supposed to do i'm not blaming fuad by all means, do that. But then you, you also hope that the players on the pitch kind of back up your, your, your shit talk. And with Spurs, man, I'm, I keep telling you, man, with Spurs fans, they're writing in checks that their team and their club are unable to, to, to cash in. Simple as that. And look, I, I get it, bro. I get it. Saliba and Gabriel, they clamp Howland. Like, they're, they're, they're some of the best to do it. But I don't even feel like they, they got out of first gear today. Honestly, I, I thought it was very, very routine from Arsenal. And I liked the, the interview towards the end from Jorginho. And I was it Gabriel? Jorginho, I can't remember who, who, who he did the interview with. And Jorginho, I didn't think I had a great game today. I actually thought he was one of Arsenal's worst, worst performers. I didn't think Arsenal had a lot of great performers, to be honest, individually. I thought as a unit, they were very good. But I was looking at a few of them. Martinelli, boy, let me not even speak on him. But a few of them genuinely weren't that great. And Jorginho uh, in particular, right? But one thing that Jorginho said that really like stuck with me and I really respect about Arsenal, he's saying, wow, it's hard work out there, man. Like we had to work for that result. We had to, 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 to sweat for that result. And as you should, it's a, it's a game against your biggest rivals geographically. You're fighting to stay in this title challenge. You know, next week, the big dogs, you got to go visit them. It's a do or die game. Every game for Arsenal right now must win. Hell yeah, you got to sweat for it. I, I like that. Genuinely, I, I liked hearing that from Jorginho. From Spurs, though, I watched them on the other side, and it's like, you know what Spurs remind me of, Chad? I, I watch Spurs, honestly, right? And it's like, don't take any offense to this Arsenal fans. But you know what Spurs remind me of? They remind me of the early 2010s Arsenal team with half the talent. In terms of, they want to walk everything into the back of the goal, uh, back of the net. They want to play the perfect passes. They want to play, no one can touch them. No one can even mark them within three. Let, let us play our game. Let us, let us dance let us be nice arsenal of today i don't know they're playing like the arsenal of the invincibles bro win every single 50 50 this is war genuinely man honestly it's like it's like watching arsenal 2010s but instead of fabregas you have bentancourt instead of van percy you have brennan johnson my god man my god no the, bro the, the, the arsenal team of the 2010s is, is a better team because they have better players but i'm telling i'm talking about the, the way they approach games it's too nice man honestly spurs have no nastiness to their game whatsoever None. There's no ruthlessness to their game whatsoever. 
And you can throw me the Romero. You can throw me Bentancourt. Like I said, man, like how I opened it. It's easy being a bastard against Everton, bro. Anyone can go be a bastard against Everton. When you're up against Gabriel on a set piece and you basically have to bully the other guy or the, or, or the other guy scores. And that's the way you kind of get pushed off the ball. Save me your, your hard man talk, bro. Honestly, save me that. Genuinely. Twitter wants us to be naive and send seven attackers forward every attack and get smoked. Genuinely, I don't know how anyone can say anything about Arsenal. I, at one point... I thought the game was going to end nil-nil because for me, it was a poor game in terms of like as a neutral watching it, it wasn't that exciting. I don't think Arsenal played an amazing game, but given the cards that they had, they're the ones traveling away from home. Spurs are the ones I'm expecting to take the game to Arsenal. Genuinely, that's what I was expecting today. For me, Arsenal, they should not be getting shit from anybody, man, honestly. Also, the positioning of certain players was flat out odd. Sun was holding a uh, touchline, so Udogi can... Can I say this, by the way, about Udogi, right? Good player. Can we stop this Udogi inverted shit? I know this is the new thing in 2024 that every fullback you have has to invert. Udogi is not that great at inverting. He's not. If anything, I, I watch him for the Italian national teams at, at times. I, I look at him as a, as a player. This, for me, is a touchline fullback. Hold your width. Bomb down the line. You're a terrific athlete. You got a pretty good whip on you. You're pretty technical. Why does every fullback now in 2024 have to play as a midfielder? And I think Udogi, more than anybody, I get for some guys, right? I see when I see, I don't know, uh, Rico Lewis doing it, fares. When I see Zinchenko doing it, fares. Udogi? I don't get that one, man. I don't get that one. So to finish off on Spurs, then we can talk a little bit about Arsenal. And I hope Spurs fans don't take this personally because I, the reason I'm also really annoyed at you guys, I had high hopes for you guys this season. Now, don't get it twisted. If it's between you guys and United, of course, I'd rather my team finish in top four. But ignoring all that, I predicted Spurs to, to kind of build off last season and make the top four. At the moment, Spurs have one win in four. One win in four, and it's their worst start in nine years. Is it the end of the world? It's not. Is it concerning? Hell yes. Please don't please don't try and, and, and tell me, Spurs fans, that you guys are not a little bit concerned about what you're seeing from your team this year. This was supposed to be a year where, okay, you added some strength in attack. Well, okay, Solanke still needs to kind of be better into the team. Uh, you brought some youngsters. I don't think either of them played today. I don't, I don't know whether that's through injury, tactical, I'm not sure. But it's pretty obvious what the goal for the season was. Build off last year, get into the Champions League, challenge for, for, a, for a trophy, which could still end up happening, right? This isn't involved in the league. Off the f basis of the first four games, to be honest with you guys, chat, I'm not moved. I'm not moved. When I'm looking at Aston Villa, when I'm even looking at Newcastle, Chelsea are looking strong at the moment. Look, do I expect Spurs to be in and around those places? Yes, but at the at the current moment, man, I think, there, I think there's a bit of concern there, man. And I, for me... It's up to Ange. I'm looking at that team out there right now. A lot of those players are his guys or players that have been signed under him. And again, this is ironic from me because I'm the one who has been riding out for Ange for the longest. And anyone who knows me knows I'm a big fan of the guy. But you don't, you don't have as many excuses this year as you did last year. Last year was a bit for me like Ten Hag's first year in terms of it's not really your team. You're coming to a team with poor expectations. They've just lost one of their biggest talisman. Shock us. This year, I don't think Spurs fans will be as accepting. And I, I think rightfully so. They shouldn't be as accepting of just the bare minimum. And I'm not saying last year was the bare minimum, but the expectation is to improve from last year. So far, I'm not very impressed. I think Ange is one of the most one-trick pony managers. No adaptability, no plan B, just not good at changing on the fly. He's very stubborn. I don't think you can even argue that, Oliver. He's very set in his ways. And I don't think that's a bad thing as a manager, right? Like, you want your manager to have a set identity, and it's like, that's the way his team plays. You, you identify a team immediately from the way they play. And with Spurs, you know the way Ange wants to play. But I feel like in 2024, the word pragmatic has become like a, a slur. It's become like a word you're not supposed to say out loud. Pragmatic. Be tactically smart. Defend your box. Like, you're not supposed to say that stuff. Everybody wants to... I look at Southampton yesterday, right? Southampton are, are living and dying by playing out from the back, bro. Like, what happened to just to just defending, bro? What happened to, to, to just trying to get... Res like, I don't understand it, right? Like, it's not a bad thing to be pragmatic. And Arteta is the ultimate proof of that. Even, even Pep Guardiola, for God's sake, man. We talk about Pep as if he's this mad scientist and all he wants to do is tiki-taka, tiki-taka. Watch the way City won that game yesterday, bro. Brentford had almost just as many passes as City. Brentford could have been 2-0 up within 10 minutes. Brentford were the ones marking them basically man for man. How did City get their winner yesterday? Er, uh, what's his name? Ederson on the ball, sees Erling Haaland making a run in behind. Long ball over the top. Erling Haaland bullies his defender. One-on-one, -on -one, beat the keeper. That's the game. It doesn't have to be rocket science every time. It doesn't have to be 50 passes between your center backs, inverting fullbacks and all that stuff to win every single game. Sometimes you just got to get it how you live, man. And I feel like with Spurs, that's the biggest issue here. It's If, if Ange's system doesn't work, and, some, and for the most part, it does. You look where they finished last year, fifth. 
Where are they going to finish this year? Probably in around those places. For the most part, it does. But when it doesn't, as a manager, how can you tweak things on the fly? How can you give your team the best chance to succeed when your own tactics clearly aren't up for it on the day? I think with Ange, he doesn't give his team enough of a chance if he gets it wrong. Managers get it wrong all the time. Players have off days. But how do you adapt? At the current moment, again, big fan of Ange. I'm, I'm questioning his adaptability. And I don't think I'm wrong to do so. I think a lot of people are at the moment. Let's be real. This match was a 50-50. Could have ended either way or even a draw. First of all, I don't think Spurs were ever going to win this game. Unless, just like Arsenal, they kind of won off a set piece. Romero leaps highest and he, and he scores. I, for me, I wouldn't have been surprised if it finished nil-nil. For a long time, I was actually thinking this game screams nil-nil to me. Because neither team are really playing that great. There aren't that many chances in it. Like... If there was any, I don't want to sound like LeBron James here in terms of like, oh, I knew it was going to happen, right? But if this game was ever going to be won, it was going to be off a set piece. It was 1-0, scrappy. And it's not even so much that like Arsenal dominated Spurs. Like I'm, I'm really trying not to say that. I don't think they did. I think they just played a, a smart game plan. But that's the issue here. Arsenal came in injured. They came in with big misses. They came in with big suspensions. They came into a tough away ground or what's supposed to be a tough away ground. And they, they just got done. They just took care of business. 